but ultimately they're kind of chased around the world and everywhere they go, they're developing new methods for smuggling weed, basically, and, and globalizing previously closed off, uh, essentially more isolated areas. What are you talking about? Smoking in a bong or a blunt. Grass. Thank. Reefer. What's his job about? It just means like, that's the fucking joint. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to Exploring Cannabis and Exercise. This week I'm talking to my friend and colleague, Dr. Dominic Corva, who's the director of the new Cannabis Studies degree at Cal Poly Humboldt. His professional expertise is in geography and drug policy, so we're going to cover a ton of interesting topics today that we normally wouldn't talk about here, including the role of surfers in globalizing or smuggling weed across the world, and the policies that restricted the research on the benefits of cannabis for so many years. He also talks about the Cannabis Studies undergraduate program now in its first semester at Cal Poly Humboldt, and we even talk about smoking joints and playing ping pong. Make good choices out there, and here we go. Okay, you were saying about the essential readings. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for uh, you know, people who want to learn about the social history of cannabis, and it's not just a history, it's a geography as well, right? And this relates back to something we connected on, I think, fairly early on, which was my you know take on the history and geography of you know cannabis and sport in particular. Yeah, and so that. yeah. So my mind immediately went to uh, the band of surfers, basically, who invented modern cannabis smuggling, basically, <laughs> uh, back in the 60s and 70s. And there are a number of interesting books that uh, are about it, and they're popular nonfiction, mm -hmm. which is to say they're engaging, they're stories of this phenomenon, these people and where they went. They're well-researched, a lot of interview of people who participated in it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a co-author, uh, Ty Stick, actually, I think was a, a member of the, the Brotherhood of Eternal Love is the surfer gang I'm, t I'm referring okay. to, right? Um, so Ty Stick is more recent and focuses on Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. But earlier, maybe 10 years ago or more, uh, there was a book by Nick Scow called Orange Sunshine, mm -hmm. which is the first popular telling of the emergence of like a countercultural tribe Mm. Right. It wasn't the only one, but it was it was really significant in that it connected kind of the history of cannabis in Southern California. Right. Into like part of global cannabis culture. Right. Like how they made it through what they did mm -hmm. uh, and who they were. Right. And, you know, given these books are generally, you know, there was bad stuff that went with it. I don't want to say that these books romanticized necessarily, although probably mm. they do a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, there's a hero's narrative uh, to a certain extent, or an anti-hero's narrative, to, right. be, to be precise. Yeah. And so... Going against the man. Yeah, totally, yeah. totally. Mm. So these guys start out as actually like a motorcycle gang uh, in the 50s in San Diego. The core that kind of like grew the this thing into an organization, this family into... You know, a criminal organization, uh, a drug trafficking uh, organization, and so they were kind of street toughs, basically, rebel without a cause. You know, like. Wait, the, were these surfers, or like they they got they contacted? The they surfers became to do surfers that. over time as well. I think they were bikers. they were surfers. They were they were bikers first, and then they were surfers, if I remember correctly. I right? never would have thought that. No, no. Yeah. So. Story goes that they they robbed a Hollywood party one night basically and took all the drugs that everybody had and <laughs> and uh, they took the acid in particular uh -huh. and at the end of this acid trip like they had been kind of transformed like into I think you know people who infused you know their consciousness with uh, you know a spirituality right and they developed that spirituality in particular in very kind of like, you know, certain ways in terms of style and so forth, right? Uh, but they went kind of on a mission basically to um, dose everybody okay. on the planet. That was their mission. Okay. Uh, but LSD wasn't... What was this, What was it called again? 
I feel like uh, I've heard about this before. What was it called? Born Sunshine. Right. Okay. So that's from that book. That's Born from that Sunshine book. book. Right. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so along the way, they end up like living in a succession of like kind of communes, basically, mm-hmm. uh, from which they do things like have a plane drop like thousands and thousands of tabs of acid on you know people at concerts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, from the plane, basically, right? They, you know, the LSD wasn't the money-making thing. That was, like, the kind of just divine sacrament that, like, they wanted to give to the world in many ways. They are probably syncretic. They had some elements of Christianity, Buddhism, whatever else. Uh, But uh, uh, the key thing was LSD, you know, could change your consciousness. And so uh, when Timothy Leary from the East Coast, the Harvard professor that was turned into the countercultural guru, uh, turn on, tune in, and drop out right. was the message. Uh, came west because he had annoyed a lot of people in the east <laughs> uh, and ended up staying at their commune and, you know, being a part of their scene. So they're also, they're probably dealing other drugs, uh, but weed in particular had become a uh, pretty good, um, you know, business model for them. Mm. So, because they were surfers, like, they would go down to Hawaii, or, or down to Hawaii, over to Hawaii, they'd surf in Hawaii, and there was weed there. Mm-hmm. They'd surf in Thailand, there was weed there, mm-hmm. you know. Um, they'd surf in Mexico, you know, there was weed there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, they got involved, uh, and increasingly in a, you know, game with the U.S. federal government that really culminated in the creation of the DEA, as an international, you know, uh, force, because they were chasing these guys around the world. Um, but they would go to South Africa, and there was weed there. Uh, you know, there's, there's, they're like endless summer dudes, right? Basically, yeah. Like, and, and in fact, literally, because like, one like of them there, is like in the first endless summer. As <laughs> one of the main surfers. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Yes. Like, like in that movie, like in that story of yeah. the end of the summer. Yes, in wow. no, I mean the the nonfiction documentary in yeah. the summer from like 1969 or something like that. Right. And then there was endless. There was like two. one of these guys like in the actual movie. Absolutely. Like, wow. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if the entire movie wasn't funded by marijuana smuggling, actually. <laughs> uh, so, you know, they get kind of chased around the world, but they're as they everywhere they go, they like pick up a new, like oh, you know, like hash. Not that hash was new, but actually smuggling and mass from Pakistan and Afghanistan uh-huh. came from like them and people like them because it grew into a very large network that was wow. you know countercultural mafia basically. So are they like bringing seeds from country to country, following? No, culture? they were they were they were packing hash into surfboards, for example, uh, hollowed out surfboards wow. uh, was a big way that they smuggled hash and. They also took up, you know, sailing, and so like they would buy boats and sail them across the Pacific Ocean to not, you know, to be their own, get it at the source and and and, and be their own middle middle person. Wow. And there were some, you know, stories of hijinks, uh, you know, on the sea and, you know, ships that had to be scuttled. Uh, there was in fact a, a large uh, cache of uh, weed that showed up in. Um, Near Shelter Cove, what's that called? Uh, oh, Bear Harbor. Bear Harbor. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in like nineteen, in the, in the early seventies, maybe. Uh huh. And you know, there is the story of essentially because Bear Harbor was where they would come in. They right. wouldn't necessarily go to like San Francisco. Mm-hmm. That was the whole point: sail to Hawaii. Yeah. And and stimulate the Hawaiian weed economy because uh-huh. they're bringing you know seeds and and so forth, and you know living in communes and in you know whatever else. Uh huh. And increasingly, like, you know, expensive hotels, you know. Uh, the, these these stories do kind of cast it a little bit like a Hollywood thing where, like, you know, uh, they develop other, you know, drug problems and, and so forth. Mm. But ultimately, they're kind of chased around the world, and everywhere they go, they're developing new methods for smuggling weed, basically, and, and globalizing previously closed-off, uh, essentially more isolated areas. Although we shouldn't assume that they were isolated, but relative to like the global reach and right. uh, getting to the U.S. consumption market and so forth. Yeah, which I think it's. I mean, I think this this whole story is is super interesting because it's um, obviously like we it, it it comes from all over, but then yeah. like 
how it's gotten into societies obviously yeah. happened through smuggling a lot of the time. Yeah. But and the fact that it the, it's related to surfing is the like sport of surfing was sport. invented by these people. Yeah. And their and their followers and, and whoever else came after them. Yes. Like, like that's crazy to the, me. You know, uh, but it's professionalized since then, obviously. Right. Uh, uh, and I couldn't tell you when, but like you know, Santa Cruz, the city of Santa Cruz is a countercultural place mm -hmm. in no small part because like that was like a, one of the best surf spots, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, other parts of, of California and, and around the world as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and they had the money to basically, you know, surf all the time and have competitions, you know, develop out of that culture, not necessarily out of the, the brother of eternal love, but like surfer culture like yeah a lot of it kind of just ran through them uh right. and, and very early because obviously like they're they're at the same surf spots like the people who are smuggling the drugs and the people who like just surfing in general like yeah. there's a lot of that yeah overlap. there's a lot of overlap <laughs> yeah yeah there's a lot of overlap it yeah. used to be uh, anyway um, i don't know what yeah. to say that's the case today you know I know. I, I, um, I think I talked in a presentation I gave um, last year when you were first telling me about this because mm -hmm. I looked into um, the um, surfing organization and yeah. like, obviously it started out, no, we're not going to do drug tests like that. That like, yeah. did not even occur to any of them yeah. like as an option. Yeah. And then now because it's part of the, the um, Olympic games, like yeah. it'll be part of the Paris Olympics. Yeah. And um, and so now all of the athletes have to Get undergo the yeah. World Anti-Doping Agency. And they probably don't take drugs except for steroids uh, now. You know, like, uh... <sighs> yeah. And so, I mean, it, it's kind of like, like one of those things with uh, at one point someone was talking about making like yoga an Olympic activity. And it's mm. like, well, that goes against like what yoga is actually oh, about. Yeah, right. And I kind of feel the same way about surfing. But, but it's a countercultural all... sport. Right. It's a countercultural right. sport. And that's that's what the surfing culture kind of is uh, that like you so, know, grew out of Southern California. Right. Like hippies come from Northern California, surfers come from Southern California, and definitely there were hippies down there and people hippies up here surf, you know. Yeah. But like that's distinct uh, you know right. cult cultures. Yeah. Um, that have globalized, uh, you know. Um, uh, so interesting. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, any other geography kind of things come to mind um, as, as we're talking about, like, cannabis and sport and exercise? Um, or like, I mean, yeah, like, where, do, where does your educational brain go? <laughs> uh, well, uh, it goes towards, you know, the work you're doing. Mm -hmm. You're picking up a thread, right? of like research that like people did yeah. up until the 1970s basically yeah and then they just all stopped doing it there's like a, just a complete like the basic stuff about like how does cannabis affect you know athletic performance and uh, that, all that stuff like they were starting to do that until basically someone told them not to right uh and it's you know the work that you and and this kind of subfield of cannabis studies that is crosses into kinesiology is yeah taking up this thread basically because we're, we're finally back at that point where we're allowed to do so right mm -hmm. uh even if we're highly limited right in how we can do it mm -hmm. so i think that that right now you know in, in the united states it's this way but i think elsewhere it's more open yeah uh can you think of like where the the latest stuff that you've been reading about comes from well and, and that's I was just about to ask you about um, Colorado. Like, um, mm -hmm. that's where a lot of my colleagues who mm -hmm. are doing this awesome cannabis-related uh, research are are in Colorado. Yeah. And it seems like um, the Colorado universities have been like way ahead of what we've been able to do in the California state system. Yeah. That's a, because like geography matters. Like, yeah. Colorado is a different kind of state. So yeah, like, why do you think things? that Colorado has been more open to it? Well, Colorado is a much more libertarian mm. place. Okay. Uh, and they have a, you know, uh, a highly centralized urban population, right? Mm -hmm. Well, how did we originally like, get to Colorado? Because, like, I, you oh, know, sure. Colorado is, like, one of those states that people yeah. associate with weed. Oh, And so okay. how did it become that? Yeah, absolutely. So 
that's a relatively recent development. Mm. Um, although there's I feel been, like it was even before it became legal there. You know, like I moved there. Be, yeah, they did before, medical. So, so Colorado. Well, I, I moved there before yeah. any of that happened, and and I still associated yeah. with with weed. So like. So Colorado medical got off the ground in the 2000s, I believe. Okay. Uh, possibly like 2008 or something. So much later than California. Mm. And at that point, what they were doing with medical was regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, that it was a new generation of medical cannabis ordinances. Got it. That you know the previous ones were leave those people alone. Yeah. Uh, and then these were, and this is how you're going to be taxed and permitted. Yeah. Uh, and so Colorado already had a you know. A regulatory system that had, you know, birthed a, you know, already kind of regulated market a little bit. So maybe there there was the more familiarity that was built in for yeah. uh, essentially, you know, the Colorado bureaucracies to have a familiarity. And I think that, that could have had something to do with it. But like culturally, like why, but culturally, like why, sure. do, you, why okay. do people, why do people like associate other than just legalization? Other than legalization, well, okay, Colorado is, is not deeply historically a cannabis place, right? Mm. Like, yes, there were countercultural There's enclaves. There's pockets of it. There are little pockets of yeah. it. Um, the, like the, what is it? The, like in Boulder. And yeah, like, Boulder, um, sure, oh, exactly. That, yeah. that area like outside of Boulder, too. Yeah, um, yeah. I think like the Naropa Institute is there or something okay. like that. Um, you know, a bunch of hippie intellectuals from, from the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. So um, anywhere you find that, you're going to find, you know, a little weed. Hippie uh, intellectuals. But I will say, like, as of, like, 2000, so 23 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, I made friends with um, some guys who were, they were in Colorado, and they were, like, college kids. And so they were college weed dealers, basically. Yeah. And so, you know, they said, like, they got their stuff from humble right uh and so you know I, colorado didn't really start you know growing its own population or its own uh cultivation really until i think the mid-2000s which you know I'm, I'm, i'll probably have like a whole nother podcast about this but one of the things that um i talk about with, with rose all the time is that a lot of the weed and most of the weed in colorado is indoor which is like yes, insane to me because there's so yeah. much sun, sunshine. But it's not um, the right climate, really. Right. The altitude is maybe too high. Oh, interesting. Um, uh, there are a number of things that, uh, I mean, Colorado grows hemp. Mm. Um, quite a lot of hemp. From from like a physiological perspective, mm -hmm. my colleagues who've done that research, yeah. um, looking at, you know, we all say, the oh, weather, yeah. The rain. Oh, right. In Colorado, they do, they've done research about inflammatory and biomarkers and cannabis users. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all of the buzz out there about cannabis is like, oh, it, it improves your inflama in, inflammation. And it's like, no, the research actually showed that, like, there's increased inflammation in cannabis users in that sample. And mm -hmm. so, um, and, and they were both equally as physically active, with the, like, both groups but they had higher inflammatory biomarkers. And mm -hmm. so I sometimes wonder like how much of that is related to indoor grown versus outdoor grown. Like how does that impact people similarly or differently? Oh, it's pretty similar. Because I've also heard yeah. like there's more um, like anxiety and paranoia with mm -hmm. indoor grown. Well, I mean, these are all, you know, uh, hypotheses that... Uh, I know. These are all... It's like we have so many questions we need to answer. They are. And, so and, and there's like, geographies of those hypotheses, too, because, like, the people coming up with those ideas are probably people from up here who grow outdoor. Totally. So, yeah. Uh, it's definitely all the outdoor yeah. folks that are like, indoor is bullshit. So the inflammation biomarker. Okay, let me mm -hmm. get you back to that yeah. for a second. Sounds nice, but, like, who invented that? Uh, mm. What it's are, a pretty it's like a really standard like test is, that people, okay. yeah yeah and that's that's like you know with a lot I mean, of the, I mean, it goes against like almost everything really like well against a bunch of rat research yeah totally yeah yeah <laughs> um yeah, and yeah like, personal and so, experiences of, of uh, you know people i've known because like they, they right usually treating running soreness inflammation from right you know, exercise and, and that's right? that's the kind of thing where it's like well, this is news I to me. I haven't seen that research. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sure it exists, and like, I'm mm -hmm. like, once things get cellular, I just like lose interest. I can't. I just can't be interested mm -hmm. in that. Right. But, um, but I, I mean, like, I, I know there's a variety of ways to to look at inflammation, and I, um, 
obviously people have like really positive experiences with cannabis for a whole variety of like medical reasons that there might not actually be any research to support, yeah. Yeah. but it's like the, the, um, placebo effect is also really yeah. good. Yeah. And like, there's nothing wrong with that. And so like with, I was talking with um, someone about MMA and, um, like, oh yeah, weed helps me sleep. It's like, you were just in a fight for your life. Yeah. Like, of course, weed's going to help you sleep. Like, mm-hmm. it's going to calm you down yeah. so that you can sleep. Like, yeah. you were just <laughs> being attacked yeah. for X amount of time. Like, mm-hmm. maybe it's that. Maybe it's not an impact on, like, the you know, whatever happens to your sleep, whatever. It's like, sure. it just kind of calms yeah. you down. I don't know. But, I mean, like, the weed makes you sleepy thing is also, like, kind of different by each person. Right. You know? Like, uh... So, um, well, and, and like, you know, with any of this kind of cannabis and exercise research, mm-hmm. like we've found that people are, are saying that they're, they're using like sativa strains before, um, exercise mm-hmm. right. and, um, <laughs> and, you know, there's so much more to, to weed, but like, even with my own exploration of all this can of country weed, mm-hmm. I, I go in, I want to know nothing about the strain and just like mm-hmm. see how it affects me. And it's like, yeah. Different weed affects mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. individuals differently. And so um, I, I just find that so interesting that mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, we want to just say like, oh, yeah, cannabis improves performance or, or it harms performance. Sometimes it could help performance. Sometimes yeah. it can't yeah. for a whole variety of reasons. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it's been a, a fun process of, yes. of figuring out like that, the individual difference thing. Um, yeah, you know, um and also fun to know that what I've been doing has been ethno, what, what kind of research did I, did you call it? Um, ethnography, bio, something, auto, auto, auto ethnography. Oh, auto ethnography, yes. Yeah, yeah. Auto yeah. Ethnography. yeah. So. Welcome to a social science methodology. <laughs> And this is why I love having um, colleagues from across yeah. di- disciplines because it's like I never would have known that that was a thing. Yeah. So, so like, what is that? What is auto? Well, it's, you know, it's the acknowledgement that the self has been embedded in a field of study, right? Mm-hmm. In the social relations that constitute that field in some way, shape, or form. So, like, you have, you're, you're reading your own history through, you know, different kinds of sort of lenses, basically, mm-hmm. to come up with an insight about, you know, maybe a concept or, or, or just, you know, provide history, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the basic building block of scientific, you know, inquiry is, like, just getting to know something, right? Um, yeah. And, and so, so, like, so the thing is, like, ethnography is variously structured. Like, it can be extremely structured or it can be fairly loosely structured. Mm-hmm. And the same with eth- autoethnography, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you can take a very kind of, like, structural approach with it where, you're like, you're... You're thinking about, you know, what happened to research in terms of uh, drug policy history, mm-hmm. right? You know, or, you know, it can just be deeply reflective, basically, you know, that you're not just sort of saying what you've observed, but analyzing it, mm-hmm. you know? But it's, it's, it really is like the f- just foundation of any kind of knowledge. Like you, in order to ask the right questions about something, you have to know something about it. Mm-hmm. Right. And so yeah. like, what's what's the you know, what's the first thing you do? You know, mm-hmm. you introduce yourself. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. And, and it like reminds me of my cultural anthropology classes from back yes. in the day where yeah. if you are inside something, sometimes you can't you don't even know the questions to ask because it's just so familiar. Mm-hmm. Um, and the autoethnography actually by reflecting makes it unfamiliar to yourself. Ooh. You think about it like, you know, out of the context of it, like you, you think reflexively right. about something that, that, that has happened. Right. You locate yourself in that thing that you're trying to analyze. Right? Interesting. What of that thing is? So, so like the your own internal biases are like part of the process. Or you like, acknowledge or that. Like you're tra- okay. So but you're, but you're being transparent. And and you're trying to yeah. understand what those biases are, maybe as well. That could be one reason to do it. Absolutely. Okay. Mm-hmm. Interesting. But, um, yeah, because that that's something that I think about a lot. With um, I mean, just the evolution of how the researchers in like health sciences have talked about cannabis Mm -hmm. over the last 20 years. A lot of it has been very negative, you know, talking about 
there was a grant funding industrial complex that like, <laughs> incentivized them to make careers investigating the harms of weed. Is Tell literally... us more about that. Well, I mean, NIDA uh, essentially stands for um, National Institute on Drug Abuse, mm-hmm. uh, which may have recently changed the A to something else in an effort to like kindly rebrand. Uh, <laughs> but NIH was developed as a bureaucracy in the 80s, but kind of a minor one. And really, like, I think under the DEA, possibly, I don't remember which, but not under NIH, National Institutes of Health, mm-hmm. which is like the umbrella one. Yeah. And, but like in the, two, in the 1990s, it got put in that bureaucracy, NIH, mm-hmm. uh, and became, you know, part of the bigger funding stream. Mm-hmm. That uh, you know became available to research on health in general, but but NIDA was just like the the new branch of this particular aspect of health, which yeah. you, it's it's the perversion of public health, right? But it's public which, health yeah, at a limit like, that says like there there is like a really good reason to study addiction, like yeah, for sure. What they needed. created was was a prohibition health literature. Interesting. They you know like and because that was that was like you had to. That, say you were studying the harms of cannabis you could not say in any way shape or form that you were looking for like neutral effects right right and it wasn't until like you know 10 years ago where they started to loosen that up mm-hmm. um but it was a battle uh that uh, a number of famous doctors from the bay area uh, led the charge on because yeah when you when, yeah. when because it's been scheduled as schedule one you have to show that like there it there is some kind of medical benefit for it right even though people have been Correct. reporting this yeah. uh, medical benefit yeah. but you can't actually do the research on it because right. it's you know you have to get the approval of NIH NIDA yeah. um, DEA yeah. all of these different elements that along yeah. the way yeah. want to want the research yeah. to be a certain way so the, the and I wonder yeah. if the researchers, felt that way too you know i mean like, some of them culturally were people who didn't like cannabis to begin yeah. with some of them didn't carry the way and were like this is a career you know yeah. like uh i'm interested in these molecules and they generally were They're, they yeah. love their molecules yeah it's you know meaningful job for them yeah uh, but they're not ta- you know like they were doing the work of prohibition mm-hmm. right it was structurally incentivized yeah so uh, that's the you know, main, I think, explanation for that gap. But, you know, more generally in the 1980s, like, this country turned culturally against hippies. Mm-hmm. Like, with a vengeance and I think, like, a feeling of, like, just irritation that these people ever existed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and permeated, you know, pop culture, permeated, uh, you know... People taking jobs in university administrations, mm-hmm. you know, people becoming faculty, people in positions of authority, you know, like mm-hmm. uh, the 80s were a time when like weed was just like not popular. Mm-hmm. Cocaine. <laughs> now cocaine Getting is popular. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So it's, there's an interesting kind of like the, um, what was his name? There was a famous drug policy historian who wrote of like these cycles of popularity. Mm-hmm. For drugs in society okay you know identifying like there's a cycle here like the drug becomes popular and then it becomes unpopular and uh-huh. then it becomes popular uh-huh. um and a feeling that society cycles through drug preferences oh interesting but i would add that really like it's the other cycles that are driving the drug preferences right mm, like right it's it's literally like what's the vibe here right in the 80s the vibe was like productivity cocaine. yeah you know it was a cocaine society so it was like a work society. Um, it was a work society, but it was really a financial uh, yeah. and dominance uh, mm-hmm. society. The bankers and stockbrokers and so forth. Yeah. Uh, so the so what, where, where, where Wall are Street's we right now? And where does weed fit in that stuff right now? Fennel society is where we're in right now. Ooh. Yeah. 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 That's where we're in right now. It's like the fentanyl society. Uh, what a huge bummer. Uh, it's a big bummer. Um, yeah. But, you know, like... Um, the opiate cycle, opiates are in there in cycles as well. Mm-hmm. But again, like what is going on in society creating this yeah. vibe? You know, right. like the cocaine vibe in the 80s was like the stockbrokers. Yeah. The 90s, I don't know. Uh, I think we may have come back in the, in the 90s, but it wasn't as popular as like ecstasy. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. 
uh, club drugs, yeah. Yeah, 90s. The, maybe, like the 90s electronic, 90s is probably the, Britain the club kind drugs, of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, where, where do you, where's, what's the vibe like with um, cannabis right now, do you think? So, I think in the 2000s, cannabis was had another run yeah. as a popular drug. Mm-hmm. But I think it's on the wane. Uh, and, and, like, I feel like psychedelics are taking its place right now. Psychedelics are, yes, there's that meaning like, to it because it's like the, the you know, Really, it is the what's that called? Pyramid scheme economy, <laughs> basically. Say, say more. I don't the know. The pyramid scheme economy, uh, which is that we cycle through pyramid schemes in different commodities. Mm-hmm. You know, like, uh, and it definitely was weed for a little bit there. Mm-hmm. And now we're in the psychedelics one. Like, it's unbelievable how much money is being like poured into psychedelic like startups. Oh yeah, right? for sure. Uh, and so um, that just kind of turns into an ugly scene for me. But, like, I have a lot of friends who are in it. And, like, you know, I think they're trying to recapture what they had with weed mm. spiritually. And I think maybe some of them are succeeding. And that's great for them. Yeah. It's taking an interesting place. or It's taking an interesting shift in sport and exercise. Because mm-hmm. people are, you know... Obviously, people are interested in cannabis and exercise, or else I wouldn't be doing this. Yeah. Um, now people, it's just like, well, actually, I, I actually prefer to do like microdoses of mushrooms and then go for a run. Yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. it's like, is there any research on that? It's like we can barely do the weed stuff. You, you wanna, could do you wanna, the mushroom wanna, stuff more than you can do the weed stuff, which is crazy yeah. to me. But also, I don't know. I, I see yeah. weed as like less harmful, but yeah. um, well, you know, it's uh, more mild. Right. In terms of, uh, I think, impact. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, you know, for some people, like, mild is not what they need anymore. Mm-hmm. That's the society we're getting into where, like, mild is not what anybody is going for when it comes to drugs. Ugh. You know? Because reality is so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Bleep that out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if I have really, like, a lot of good news, but I'd, I'd like to, you know, yeah, like, uh, yeah. for sure. Um, well, tell me about the good news of uh, all the things that you're bringing to the Cannabis Studies program. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, well, so first of all, Dominic, uh, you've been at Cal Poly Humboldt since last year. Last year, one year. Yeah, but, but you and I have been co-directors of the Humboldt Institute for Interdisciplinary Marijuana Research. You've been there since like 2018, I think. Yeah, I think um, so. It's, yeah. It's, going, it's been a while now. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so um, since you joined, you applied for a massive grant mm-hmm. and got it. And you've also well, been um, helping with different policy issues ar- across the state. There's been a few things that I've been up to, but uh, one, <laughs> one thing I want to say is that, you know... And we, and we also yeah. developed the, the Cannabis Studies Program, which you the, now are the yeah, director, director for. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. But uh, around the grant, like, I want to shout out, like, that it was a team effort. For sure. We got it, not I got it. I have an incredible, you know, set of uh, co-PIs, and uh, I want to keep this as simple as possible. Yes. But let me say beforehand that, you know, why it is this complex has to do with how we wrote the grant directly to the research priority that the DCC had outlined. Department of Cannabis Control. Department of Cannabis Control, yeah. when, they, when they made their request for uh, proposals. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so um, it was definitely like a asking for really an intricate puzzle box of things, mm-hmm. let me just say. It asked for, uh, you know, work that could contribute towards, you know, con- community intellectual property, basically, mm-hmm. or inform the general, you know, intellectual property uh, landscape. Uh, and so... You know, at at sort of the, the plant base of this, you know, the legacy genetics proposal basically um, is about creating community herbaria in uh, the jurisd- jurisdictions that that work with us. Mm-hmm. It's generally around the subject of legacy cannabis genetics, and mm-hmm. the communities get to define what they mean by legacy by not just recording like with the you know a genetic uh, footprint that that yeah. goes in. Uh, but like the stories that go with why this community has decided this is a legacy genetic, like what it meant, mm-hmm. how it's like breeding may have been impacted by the war on drugs. It's a, it, it tells a story that basically is pointed towards a policy and development, which mm-hmm. is Appalachian's designations mm-hmm. that basically 
these will will help essentially those Appalachians designations folks when they when they apply because there will be a, like a community kind of intellectual property attached to it that's about the story of the plant and the and the people who you know whose lives were entwined with it. That's what I think, of course, of and 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 for others it will be different things. Yeah. But like you know, it's a story of like this is our economic plant, mm-hmm. right? Like it's our varietal. Right, uh, which you and that know, gives it like market value. Yeah, when you're doing Appalachians of origin, because the cellular side of things, all wheat is the same, and so why would anybody buy your wheat? Right. And so the point is actually because we have a record mm-hmm. of like how this came into existence. So uh, you know there are a number of other people doing cannabis IP stuff out there, and there's no reason this shouldn't be. It's not a competition with them. This is like a collective. IP. Yeah, it's community awesome. IP basically totally. community owned. That's really cool. Uh, and so, this is really the you know the to me the main part of it, which is like my my scope will be to um, kind of follow like my legacy network and stories mm-hmm. that I already have out across the broader state basically, yeah. and to to be able to tell in in two parts essentially a story, mm-hmm. one of you know. California cannabis genetics and their people, mm-hmm. right? And the economic value this plant had for like so many people. Yeah. And that and story, yeah. the two parts of it are like within California, kind of what happened. And the other part is like California's connections to, the, you know, the broader genetic, you know, the, the globalization of, of genetics, basically, which we're very, you know, much a part of and connected to. Yeah. Totally. Oh, uh, yeah. It's going to be a really cool project. I'm excited to. I'm looking forward to being able to start my interview process. This semester, I have research assistants, uh, cool. graduates and undergraduates that are starting the part, which is then, you know, gathering secondary sources because many of these stories and types of stories have been told already. Uh, and so we need to know what those are uh, right. and be able to collect them and systematically code them essentially for like right. people, places and, and the plant names. Right. right and see what comes out of that because that will help inform like when I'm doing my interviews like there will be things that people often talk about that I that will guide me in the questions I ask of right. the new people it's like no oh, like these five things seem to be like everybody talks about that but mm. in a different way oh yeah yeah and then that helps me kind of like structure essentially my my interviews with other people they can go on for hours and hours and hours otherwise because i already yeah. talked to a lot of them and it goes yeah. on for hours and hours yeah ah, that's so cool it's like it's so cool to remember that there's different types of research out there and it's not yeah. just kinesiology yeah 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 <laughs> um, well it is it is social science and this is what is very unique about this is california yeah. asked for somewhat radical social science basically mm-hmm. interdisciplinary yeah uh, but, um, oh yeah. And the other part of the RFP was that must be culturally sensitive research right. methodology that is culturally sensitive. And that's why it is this way. Uh, the community based kind of way. Yeah. yeah. So community based participatory research, CBPR mm-hmm. is that methodology, right? Okay. And Rachel uh, Gerardo from Cal state Northridge is our person for that. Cool. And she's working with Janine Coleman of origins council and, and Khalil Ferguson of the United Core Alliance, as well as the California Equity Policy Coalition, mm-hmm. uh, so that we're doing not just the rural areas that everybody thinks of, but like across the state. So there's, you know, there's a whole, you know, system of subcontracting and, and so forth that the university bureaucracy is currently working out. And we anticipate getting, we were, we're already starting in terms of like the preparation and stuff we don't need like extra money for right now, yeah. but like more towards like probably November, is what the hope is. Cool. Just, we got to get through the um, you know bureaucratic process to the, the research. So Todd Holmes at the UC Berkeley Oral History Center is filming 90 interviews, basically, wow. that are oral history interviews with people selected by these communities. And they're going to be in the digital archive at UC Berkeley uh, that you know everyone can see. So um, it's important, you know, Todd's work, uh, Janine Coleman with Origins Council, mm-hmm. like I said, uh, and Eleanor Kuntz uh, with LeafWorks, uh, yeah. our, our lab partner. So um, I didn't do this. 
like uh, you, you're you're a big part of it. But um, so with the with <laughs> just accept the compliment, Dominic. Uh, um, and so uh, this is part of the the DCC funding, and so that mm-hmm. money comes in from the sale of cannabis in the state of California. That's correct. It is laundered okay. cannabis proceeds from the state of California. <laughs> I like the way I put that. It's and, exactly and, and it's what the it same is. thing for CMCR, right? CMCR is also laundered uh, cannabis revenue. Yeah. And so CMCR is the medicinal cannabis research. Right. It's San Diego. Yeah. Right. And, you know, other universities have different Department of Cannabis Control grants. UCLA has a lot of them, mm-hmm. UC Berkeley, UC okay. Davis. Okay. Notice they're all the UC schools. Um, anyways, CSEs are better. Okay. So. Um, <laughs> Speaking of that, we, uh, we were part of the conversations around starting the Cannabis Studies Program at Cal Poly Humble, mm-hmm. part of the, the Polytechnic rollout, and now you're the director of it. And mm-hmm. so the program came together because of people across our campus from That's different such a long story, Whitney. <laughs> We got to do that one this episode? Real quick, uh, a lot of different pots in the fire, however that phrase is. A lot of people, people have different ideas for like what a cannabis studies major would be. And so, you know, like the first meeting that we had, we, we decided it was like three circles. People, planet, prosperity. Ooh, people, planet, prosperity. And then place was the center, was like the thing that overlapped among all those three. Yeah. And so like Humboldt is the place where it's like sure. most relevant to study those three aspects what's the what does the core look like like what who who are these who are the students that would be good in this program and like what classes would they take tell you the students that are good in this program already uh but uh you know we have an introduction to cannabis course which is a survey course that introduces you know all the major elements of 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 the program Mm -hmm. and also does botany and does history and geography and we're We've got that rolling right now, and I've got uh, 37 students, and they're awesome. So there's a lot of students who actually aren't cannabis majors right now who are taking it, so there's a lot of interest in the class. Cool. Uh, we should have a minor by the end of the year, so probably that will you know grow interest uh, you know uh, as a minor. Mm-hmm. And I'm currently teaching also Humboldt and uh, Canvas, mm-hmm. which is basically a you know political geography course about can- uh, cannabis and Humboldt um, mm-hmm. that I teach. It's kind of my baby class. Mm-hmm. Um, we've, we're over enrolled at 41 in that. Amazing. Uh, and the kids are fantastic. They're from many different areas over the state and have uh, you know a lot of different backgrounds. But I think that like what I heard from them a lot was they grew up in families where cannabis was taken seriously mm-hmm. for one reason or another. Right. And not always with always positive situations, uh, potentially, you know, people going to jail and stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, they had a personal connection with the plant already. Many of them. Mm -hmm. I have one student uh, who has been breeding cannabis for a while uh, from the L.A. area. Wow. He's one of my research assistants and he loves the plant so much and he loves to grow it and breed it. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't consume. Interesting. uh, Which I sorry to out you, kid. But like it's, <laughs> I, it's he loves the plant. Yeah, is the point. And, I'm trying and so to get like, to. It I doesn't, think you that you don't have to consume the plant to love the plant. Right. Exactly. And I yeah. think that you know other other programs like other cannabis related programs across the United States have been more focused on either like medical cannabis or agriculture. And I think that That's, like uh, like you're not you're not teaching kids how to like grow weed. We're not because we can't. Uh, right. and let's let's be clear. This, this how it ended up was shaped as much by our guardrails as mm-hmm. by any kind of consensus we came to. Yeah. There were things we could not do, and what we could do was make a you know policy stewardship major basically mm-hmm. that was about getting getting kids into the, this liberal arts space of history and geography and, and the policy landscape, and then go on to, to do the more technical things uh, and the more applied classes. Yeah. Uh, many of which are, you know, methods courses and, you know, advanced courses in other departments. Like, yeah. you know, you can graduate with this major and like you took hydrogeology, mm-hmm. you know, and that was actually part of your major. Yeah. Uh, if you choose to go that way. Mm-hmm. Um, there are, we have a lot of environmental stewardship concentration kids that, you know, some of them will go the softer side and policy side and some will go, uh, you know, the science side. Yeah. Uh, the, the natural science side. So that is an option. Uh, and so 
two, again, two thirds of the students are, are on that track. And yeah. that is the prerequisites that they have to take for this major and to, and in the major are natural science prerequisites. Yeah. So these, these kids come in already actually good at both kind of like social science and and it's, it's, science. and it's like more like policy based natural sciences. Is that right? No, not necessarily. Okay. Not necessarily at so all. It's like water rights. Like that. You could be, that I mean, you could be a compliance officer. You could be a compliance person in a private company. Mm-hmm. You're subject to all sorts of technical scientific reviews for, to get a permit. Yeah. Uh, and so like if you, you know, know your hydrogeology and you can actually, you know, fill out the forms yourself in yeah. house, you know, that's going to be easier. Totally. You know, or, you know, you have some folks will do restoration, you know, environmental re- restoration. Mm-hmm. You, you know, like there's, you, you have to know how to clean up the, the sites and uh, so forth, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, then, and then, you know, some will learn, you know, all of the things around the growing of the plant that contribute to, you know, someone who's growing the plant, right? Right. Uh, so we can't grow weed here, no. Um, and you can't. Anywhere else in the United States, except for apparently the University of Louisiana, without a federal... Mississippi. No. Oh. I, I said without a federal DEA oh, license, okay. which the University of Mississippi has had for 50 years. There are now a number of other entities with federal DEA licenses, and one of them is our friend, Dr. Sue Sisley. Mm-hmm. And so for years, this process for getting uh, chemistry, the Department of Chemistry, hooked up with Dr. Sisley's license to analyze federally legal weed uh, is coming to fruition fairly mm-hmm. soon. And it's over in chemistry, right? Uh, but it, it's immediately apparent that this could be quite useful for chemist studies as well. Yeah. So uh, we've yet to kind of figure out how it would open up another kind of natural science bridge. But it is complex to have a major that has so much social science and natural science. Yeah, it's it's really uh, interdisciplinary. It is. Than... Our, our units for our major are more like a natural science uh, yeah. units, actually. Interesting. Uh, which is recently alarmed Dean. So, you know, it's it's a program for, like, smart, creative people who want to play a part in, you know, the battle for, like, cannabis as what it means culturally around the world, right? Mm-hmm. Which is we want it to mean, like, something that is communitarian and something that is good for the earth, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like, however it goes, however it's regulated, however it's, whatever policies come up, whatever the regulations are, uh, at any stage, federal legalization, rescheduling, treaties changing, Mm -hmm. like, that's the time we're in right now. And Mm -hmm. people who have this knowledge and this kind of background are going to have a lot of opportunities in either the public sector or the private sector to exercise that knowledge. Yeah. Because it is incredibly useful to all these people surfing this, like, crazy landscape so you know people ask oh, what jobs are they going to get i'm like cannabis legalization produces so many more jobs than just in the private sector mm-hmm. because there's just so much that comes with it all the regulations yeah all the regulations and that produces more jobs necessary in the private sector to deal with those people and then there's nonprofit advocacy and you can go in that direction as well mm-hmm. um you could you know be a nonprofit that like administers equity grants, you know, has projects to do community reinvestment, uh, you know, depending on where you are. So, uh, you know, all that. And then also, you know, the director of the Department of Cannabis Control, Nicole Elliott, has a sociology degree, hmm. which is cannabis studies is actually a sociology degree. Here. Yeah. So what you can do with a sociology degree, you can do with a cannabis studies degree as well. Cool. All right. Anything else you want to share about a uh, cannabis studies degree or exercise? Uh, why are you looking at me to share about exercise? I need to exercise more. You you walk to campus. I do. I'm walking to campus back and forth. Do there. you uh, smoke a joint while you walk to campus? I do not. Yeah. Uh, when I, you walk home I'm, from campus? I'm, I should, and I will at some point. Because uh, it's, uh, it's in the Redwoods. Uh, it's right. in, through the Redwoods, and I could do that. But uh, I'm not a day smoker myself, but that's just me, you know? Um, oh, why not? Uh, oh, I, I don't yeah. I don't ever smoke before I teach. Yeah. That, that's just like, yeah. I can't, I, I won't yeah. do yeah. that. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But like... Like, my attention span is hard enough to manage as it is, and <laughs> I, I do think that, like, my therapeutic benefit of cannabis... Is actually like you know relaxing my brain. Yeah. You know, and uh, I really need to be able to just you know generally speaking, it's just harder to get like grunt work done yeah. when I'm high. If mm-hmm. it's something I'm enjoying, yes, no problem. But like administrative stuff, which is a large part of our jobs, uh, I can't <laughs> do can't do that while high. 
Yeah. It's yeah. not going to work. Totally. Yeah. Do you ever smoke and play ping pong? Oh, yes. Regularly. Okay. Tell me about that. I mean, when don't I smoke and play ping pong? Um, you know, most of the time when I play ping pong, we smoke a joint first. Okay. Uh, but Do you feel like you're better at it? or Okay. Like I got why? a specific story for you. Yeah. My uncle Art. Uh, who's uh, 10 years older than me, but was kind of a surrogate, you know, m- male figure for me maybe when I was younger. Sort of fatherish person, right? Uh, even though he was sort of my fun uncle, basically. Yeah. Highly competitive athlete uh, most of his life. He's recently apparently retiring from things. But, you know, played like national pro-am softball, played basketball, played golf. He just loved sports, loved to play them, and he loved to dominate at them. Like, I'm short. I'm 5'5". Five five. You know, like, we would have one-on-one-on-one games, basically, with my buddy James, who's like 6'1", you know, probably back then 250 or 60. He was a college uh, uh, defensive end. Uh, and my uncle Art, who was good six foot and... Art was always you know, athletic, but like he was like one of those kind of big guys that was yeah. athletic, you know. So good, good two plus two hundred plus. And uh, part of my strategy would be like calculating how much they wanted to protect themselves from the other person or, or versus me. But like no, like they would just like mercilessly stuff me uh, and team up to like just do it because like I'd handle one of them sometimes, yeah. but not both of them at the same time. Yeah. So this stuck in my craw over the years a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> My uncle Art comes up and we, um, he doesn't smoke anymore. You know, I do. So we played ping pong um, and I didn't smoke before the first 15 games. Mm-hmm. And I beat him 15 games, right? And then, uh, you know, and he was like getting increasingly, you know, competitive and, and just it's like, I'm going to win one of these. I, you know, you can't make it to 35 mm-hmm. uh, games. And so I was like, all right, but I'm going to smoke a joint. Uh, go out back and smoke the joint. And like, I've been kind of like taking it like, a little easy on him in Uh the first 15 games but like I just came to a like complete sort of like zen calm and I just got merciless and I I I beat him for the next 20 games uh sorry Uncle Art if you're hearing this I love you so much and it's a really great story you have to admit um so uh you know like the 7-0 games were actually a number of those you know skulls uh, and so that was definitely a conscious, like, I'm going to smoke weed and get like focused. Okay. Uh, athletically, mm-hmm. uh, because with ping pong, you got to let go of your brain and, mm-hmm. and be, you know, reactive. Yeah. You know? Um, so, uh, you, you've really got to like just move quickly without thinking. So do you feel like your reaction time is like the same as if you were sober or like, or or are you better because yeah, I felt like I played better than I've ever played. Yeah. Uh, and, that, and you still that feel instance. that now when, yeah. you, when you... No, no, not necessarily. So what, what's behind it now? Behind it now, um, behind it now is making sure I understand who it is I'm playing. My buddy Aaron, like, I might get a little too high. Uh, before <laughs> uh, and so there's always kind of a period of like... Uh, uh, and then, um, then we warm up and then he actually, like when I play him, the degree of difficulty of the things both of us are trying is like just pushing us both. Okay. Uh, so that's a lot And of you guys fun. are both really high while you're doing and it? And having a lot of fun, basically. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. I mean, we basically kind of play a freestyle that is just keep the ball going. It doesn't uh-huh. matter if you've like hit the table or not. Like, right. You want to just keep the volley going and you're practicing different kinds of shots as you're doing that mm. uh, that give you like the courage to try it like it's way out of bounds when it's yeah you know throw that spin on it and and then like oh maybe i can do that you know when i'm not in this position so. right that's one of the things i've experienced with smoking and, and climbing for example where it's mm-hmm. like i just like get creative sometimes and yeah. and just want to put my body into different things yeah. that I, would, I usually wouldn't try yeah. and so i think it can be helpful and, yeah. and performance enhancing and and like getting your body to to try different ways of doing the same thing you've always done yeah yeah it does make sense although for basketball players i think it's about doing the same things they've always done but just high <laughs> yeah. i mean and that's kind of running you know, like I don't need to yeah. try yeah. different running. Although sometimes it's been fun um, mm. to like 
run up a hill going like a zigzag pattern just to like have fun because yeah. it's like silly and like I'm high on a run in the woods. <laughs> what is it Someday I'm going to exercise enough to join you on one of those runs in the woods. I used to be fleet of feet uh-huh. and, and ran a lot and with joy. I need to rediscover that. But uh, first walking to school, you know, it's a big, yeah. Yeah, big change totally. for me and um, big, big help. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I know. I didn't exercise all summer. <laughs> I just got out of my rhythm with it and was traveling enough that like I could just never stick to a consistent yeah. pattern. And I'm a fair weather runner and the weather was so shitty this summer that I just didn't, it wasn't ever perfect weather enough for me to run. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, I, I'm getting back into it and, and like the weed definitely helps make it better. Yeah. Because it's like, I don't care about how fast I'm going. Because if otherwise I'm like in my head about like, what are my stats? Like, what's my gait pattern like right now? Am I really activating my quads? It's just, it's just mm-hmm. a lot. Overthinking it. Oh yeah, for sure. Like mm-hmm. that, that's the problem with, at least for my brain, the way that yeah. exercise science research went. Like the more I understood exercise, the harder it was to just enjoy exercise. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. cannabis can exercise imagine. for me is like, yeah. I can just enjoy it again yeah. and not think about Well, listen, research. you just hit upon like a key thing that like why this major is pretty awesome is that like you learn about other subjects through plant that you're already passionate about. Right. Right. And like, you know, historically, like kids write research papers and do projects that are like they're weed, but they're in a class that isn't yeah. generally about weed. And this, this gives them a way to, you know, do that. Yeah. You know, to have that. Totally. Uh, in a systematic fashion, because I think that you learn better, you know, just like you exercise Applying better. Applying it into your life. And when, yeah. When it's something you care about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, that, that you've got a positive relationship with. It yeah. It's meaningful to you. Exactly. It's like the difference between a drudge, drudge job and a job that's meaningful. Right. It's like, it's, it's meaningful. Like, yeah. of course. It doesn't seem like work. Which is what I'm doing right now. Sabbatical, yay! Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, you, uh, you want to smoke another joint? Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to learn more, you can follow me on Instagram at Exploring Cannabis and Exercise or at Dr. Ogle. Or you can visit my website at WhitneyOgle.com. If you want to support this podcast, you can sign up for Patreon at patreon.com slash exploring cannabis and exercise. This podcast was produced by Haley Montowski, and the music used on this podcast is called Bonfire Cauliflower, created by Isaac Joel. Make good choices out there. <laughs>